The Predator V4 is a CMOS FPV camera from Foxeer, which advertises to be a super wide dynamic range FPV camera that supports both 16:9 and 4x3 aspect ratios, is switchable between PAL or NTSC, has a low 4 millisecond latency, an input voltage range between 5 to 40 volts, and states that there is a low light improvement over the V3, which is already really good. All while weighing 5.5 grams, which is actually 5.861 grams, coming in at 0.012 grams heavier than the version 3 of this camera. In this video, we will put this camera through a wide variety of technical testing and specification validation, including picture quality testing, raw electrical latency testing, various dynamic range and light effect testing, and other tests I believe that will help you determine how well this camera will perform for you. I recently did a bench review for the Predator V3, so I will also compare this camera to that test data and point out where things have changed between the cameras. You can find a link to the V3 bench test in the video description. Recursion Lab For science. We will start with basic power consumption and efficiency testing. Connected to my bench power supply, we will see how much power this camera consumes at 12 volts, which is the nominal voltage for a 3 cell battery. At 12 volts, the average power consumption is 40 milliamps, which is 480 milliwatts of power. Bringing the voltage up to 30 volts, the current draw drops to only 15 milliamps, which is actually a little less at 450 milliwatts. On average, this camera took about 40 milliwatts more power than the V3, which is negligible. This camera is efficient when it comes to to power requirements. It also has efficient power regulation. The second part of this power test is to determine how much heat this thing generates under nominal load. For this, switch to Thermal Vision. Over a 5 minute period, this camera slowly increases temperature to 47 degrees Celsius, which is the exact same as the V3, and well under any temperature I'd be concerned about. I've placed the camera into a box to isolate all outside light. The video output of the camera is tapped with my oscilloscope, where you can view the raw analog signal with clear frame separation on the scope. An all black output shows up as a lower overall voltage, where an all white would be a higher overall voltage. I have a push button on my test board which supplies the voltage to the LEDs, turning them on. The path from the button to the LED is also tapped with my oscilloscope, so that voltage spike when the button is pressed can be clearly measured. The difference on the oscilloscope when the voltage spikes when the button is pressed to when the analog signal spikes from the white LED light will be the camera latency. On NTSC, the latency comes in at a very low and very consistent 1.5 milliseconds of latency through hundreds of samples. Like the previous version, this is 2.5 milliseconds lower than what they advertise on their website. On PAL, the latency comes in even lower. At a consistent 1.26 milliseconds through hundreds of samples. On NTSC, the results are the exact same as the V3, but PAL shows a very marginal improvement of 0.015 milliseconds, which is, again, insignificant. The latency comes in at the exact same in both night and day modes, which are selectable settings in the camera menu, which I'll go over in a bit. The good news here is that Fox here did not sacrifice latency to make other improvements in this version of the camera, which is all we can ask for at this point, given how low the latency already is. What good is low latency if the image looks awful like a CGI Sonic the Hedgehog. The image is definitely different from the V3, and I'm not entirely sure if it's an overall improvement or not. The yellow still has a greenish tone to it, and the dark blues look better, but the lighter blues are now made significantly darker, as well as all of the greens. This might make grass and the sky stand out more, but the lighter colors will be less natural. I found increasing the hue helped fix the yellows, but the blue and the greens remain the same. The color artifacts at the edges of the whites are still present, but they seem to be a bit better in this version. I made a custom image with distributed equally sized squares and circles to test how this camera may distort the perspective of an image over the surface of the lens. Objects in the center 50% of the screen have little warping, but after that you can observe the fisheye of the lens fold the corners out. The pattern and warping appear to be even, but the vertical fisheye is much less than the horizontal. This is all very normal. I have constructed a double diffused LED fixture, which I connect to my bench power supply. It has an incredible range and resolution, where I can get extremely dim and visually change brightness in 10 millivolt input increments. We will use this to test how much light is required on a surface for it to be visible from the camera. To measure this, I have a digital lux meter which can be seen by the camera as a reference. At 0.3 lux, which is the moon at full brightness, you can barely make out the number on the meter. At 1 lux, the image and meter is fairly clear and the ISO noise is much less than the previous version of this camera, albeit with a slight Terminator 2 style blue tint, which goes away at about 2.4 lux. Comparing to the V3, while the noise is less at lower light like Foxier advertised, you can actually see far less 
less below 2.5 lux. However, this is probably why Fox here includes a day and night mode in the settings, and this was day mode. Let's switch to night. In night mode, you can make up the meter at about 0.2 lux, and the ISO noise starts to clean up quite a bit around 0.5 lux, and it improves as you increase the brightness from there. Having the two options is nice, but it appears the V3 of this camera is similar to the version 4, with night mode enabled. And when you compare the images at 0.3 lux, version 3 appears to have a little less ISO noise, making the meter easier to read. The overall picture does appear to be brighter on the V4, so my original conclusion was we have minimal improvement with a bit of a noise trade-off. But I couldn't help think I might be missing some crucial difference that I don't have a test for. So I banned on the bench and set up some practical test conditions to fly under. The setup is simple. We have a backyard with porch lights and some external lights above the fence line. But around the play structure, it is too dark to walk around without a flashlight. The video you're seeing now is the Run Cam Racer 2, which I'm only walking around with since if I try to fly like this, I would fly directly into my fence. Under the same conditions, I flew with the Predator V3. As you can see, this is performing way better than the Racer 2, but I had difficulty seeing important objects, which appeared to be related to the deck and external lighting, causing the camera to darken the unlit areas significantly. While this camera does great in the dark, it really needs consistent lighting conditions for it to perform well. Now, let's see how the Predator V4 performs under the same lighting conditions, with the added bonus of some light rain to test my conformal coding application. Like we saw with the bench test, the ISO noise seems to be rather high, but the consistent image brightness makes objects a lot easier to see. The deck and external lights are still slightly annoying, especially when you add the difficulty level caused by the rain droplets, but it doesn't appear to affect the rest of the image brightness, meaning it doesn't significantly hinder my ability to navigate around. I am nowhere near as confident as I am during the day, but this is a lot more flyable than the V3 under these conditions. So, in conclusion, the V4 and the V3 both perform very well under similar low light conditions, but the V4 has an edge with better low light wide dynamic range capability. This camera came with a 1.8 millimeter lens with no advertised FOV. The FOV measured at the middle of the frame came in at 112 degrees and measured at the upper corners at 140 degrees. Switching to 69, the FOV increased by only 2 degrees. For the wide dynamic range sun test, I put my small 900 lumen flashlight at a distance that it would take about the same space on the camera as the sun would to see how the camera will respond. Outside of a lens flare and a bright halo around the light source, the rest of the bench is clearly visible. I did do a flight to capture the worst case you'll see of a sun lens flare, which would only be an annoyance if you're flying towards a race gate with the sun directly behind it. This appeared to be the exact same as the Predator V3. With the extreme light test, I took my 5000 lumen flashlight up close and turned it on and off repeatedly to see how the camera would respond. The image went grey while the light was on due to the close proximity and the amount of screen real estate the light took up. You can observe how long the camera took to recover once the light was turned off, where the first frame is completely black and subsequent frames of the camera recovers to normal state. The Foxier Predator V4 is almost identical to the V3, where the only noticeable improvement comes from added dynamic range and low light conditions and a slight color artifact reduction in the image. This seems like a minor firmware version update to the V3 instead of what I would consider a true upgrade, and if you have a V3, I wouldn't set it on fire and throw it in the trash to upgrade to this. With that said, after testing the Predator V3, I concluded that it was a really good, lightweight, low latent FPV camera that performs well in both day and low light conditions, and the V4 is no different. At this point, if I had to choose a racing FPV camera for a new aircraft, I would buy this. Hopefully, I provided all the information you need to help decide between this camera and others based on your own personal needs and preferences as well. I'd like to give a very special thanks to Rotorev and Mississauga for donating this camera to me to perform these independent bench tests with genuine interest to see how well it performs.